All right, so uh, I want to talk about strategic cloud infrastructure, and uh, what I what I mean by strategic really is is a cloud infrastructure that uh, enables uh, a startup or an enterprise's business purpose, and uh, and is well aligned with the, the resource commitment and uh, and the, the the ability for that enterprise to support their infrastructure. So a little bit about me. Co-founder and CTO of Agrable. Uh, we started as a team of six people, grew to about 60, uh, building a, a cloud-based web app for growers. Uh, we provided them weather analytics, crop growth simulation, built out of quite a few different, different features, including the, our fully autonomous uh, field survey mobile application that all pooled the data into a centralized platform that we could use to represent the network of agriculture by, uh, with a fine grade permissions model. Take some water. That was my side. Appreciate it. So, like, uh, like you heard, we were acquired back in uh, back last July, and uh, I stayed on as the head of technology for the Champaign campus, and I focus on data engineering, analytics, platform integration, and ML and artificial intelligence. So what I feel like is the central question here is, what is the best way to launch a product in the cloud? And, and obviously, kind of talking about what it means to be strategic, I've got some, some opinions on what best means, but uh, cloud technology is moving rapidly, new things are coming out all the time, uh, the paradigms are, are shifting and evolving. Uh, one example I always like to give is that for a few years at Agrable we were discussing should we be adopting more of a microservice architecture and sort of as we continued talking about that, serverless technology came in and, uh, and, and really displaced a lot of the, the conversation around microservices because it offloads all of the, uh, the setup and maintenance on the cloud provider. So all you're really doing are the, the core functions that are doing the business work that you need. And, uh, and from my vantage point, as, as sort of we're integrating with a, with a much larger enterprise, I'm sort of learning that, that cloud legacy is a thing. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is that the systems that we built many years ago are no longer uh, up to speed with the best practices of cloud technology. And as we integrate our, our cloud platform with our, uh, our counterparts, uh, uh, we're finding that we want to actually rebuild a lot of the things that we did to take advantage of new systems, new features, and products that just weren't available at the time. Uh, we also haven't experienced this too much personally, but definitely embracing technologies that then end up being not widely adopted means that you're not going to have support for those things. They're, they're more likely to be discontinued, and uh, so, so paying attention to those kind of trends is very important. But, all of this really sums up to, to, to say that the right time to build something is right when you need it, rather than building too much, too far in advance, and, uh, and take advantage of the, the latest available stable solutions. And, and stable is doing a lot of work in that sense to really mean that if something just came out last week, it may not be ready for, for, for you to put all your eggs in that basket and uh, to go all in on that as, a, as the linchpin of your, of your infrastructure. <coughs> So, I, I really, I can't stress this enough, but the team is the most important part of your, of any infrastructure project. And, uh, and building and managing that team, curating that team is really going to be a major driver of success. So, so obviously without, without people to do the work, the project won't succeed. So you need, you need a team, and, and you need a great team so that you can, you can build a great solution. Uh, I think that it's really important to, to discuss sort of as, at the beginning of a project and as a project's evolving, what are, what are the skill gaps? And, and that, that requires a very open culture, that requires a, a culture of communication to discuss what, to, to, to attempt to agree on what the, skill, what the components of the project are going to be and then do we have the right skills to do it? Do we require front-end web, back-end web, uh, big data, uh, streaming data? Uh, 
microservices slash serverless. And so all of those things end up requiring a certain amount of expertise. And people don't have to be an expert, a, a complete expert on day one if they've got a passion for, for learning it and if they're willing to engage with, with other experts, either at the cloud providers themselves or, or consultants or university academic resources to, to fill those, those skill gaps. Um, so I think it's really important to acknowledge those gaps and then, and then do something about them, take action. Uh, the team needs to be empowered to make important decisions about the project. And I kind of see that as where, where Agile comes in. Uh, I, a lot of, I mean, Agile is, is pretty much the, the standard for how, how these projects are approached these days. And, uh, but I find that a lot of people are, are doing Agile without necessarily understanding why. And really, because really the purpose of it is, is to enable that communication and to, to, put, to empower the team to be in control of its own destiny and, uh, and, and make sure that we can eliminate barriers and, and blockers to progress. So I think it's, it's hugely important to, to be constantly evolving your agile process uh, to, to enable that communication, to, uh, to do those retrospectives and then hold the team and, and the, the greater organization accountable for uh, for putting into place changes that resolve the items that come up in retrospectives. If the same complaints are coming up all the time, that's a sign that, that something's not healthy about the way you're doing your work. So, I also think a culture of, of debate is really important. Uh, if you're not having serious conversations about your architecture with differences of opinion and and disagreements, civil disagreements, uh, from time to time, then, then you probably aren't thinking hard enough about what you're doing. So I think engaging the team and, and getting people to, to form opinions, discuss the opinions, and then uh, come to a consensus and move in a, in a, in a common direction is, is critically important. And, uh, and this is one thing we learned as a, as a, as a, sort of as a growing startup is that the more things you're adding, the more, more things that you're attempting to do on the same platform, uh, the more likely assumptions you made very early on get, are shattered. So uh, an example of that is that we had a very uh, rigid uh, daily update cycle. We, our, our initial product offering was called Morning Farm Reports. And it happened in the morning, and it gave farmers a report about what, what's happening in their fields. And uh, so every, every day we, we ran our update to pull in the latest weather data, run our, run our simulations, and, uh, and send out emails. And the email product is great, but at a certain time we realized we wanted to add uh, hourly data to our website to, to, to run, uh, run similar simulations on an hourly basis. And so that's a, a 24 times increase in, uh, in the amount of work we're doing, roughly speaking times the number of products we were adding. But, uh, but that really changed, changed the nature of a lot of assumptions we had made about our, our pre-computational model. And as we move forward as part of Nutrien and, and in, in integrating with their e-commerce uh, e for growers system, uh, we're finding ourselves being asked more and more to do real-time analytics, to do how can, can, a, can a grower pick three different bags of seed that they want to buy and then get instant feedback on what what the what the simulation said, what they what which which bought, which bag they should buy, and so we're moving from daily updates, hourly updates, on demand updates, and really we're we're, we're revisiting almost our entire interest, our entire architecture to to accommodate those needs. So that's that's something that's very interesting, and I think earlier on I think we were more. It more, we more noticed it in retrospect as we added things, found things breaking, found problems, and then reacted to them. Whereas I think as a more mature organization, we're proactively saying, what will the impact of these changes be? What, how, do these, how do these business features, how does this business value uh, reverberate out into our architecture, into, into even the, the very structure of our teams and our, and our organization to say, how do we adapt to these changes? How do we how do we meet these needs? 
So scalability, uh, I think it's interesting because there's a there's there there are a lot of schools of thought on this, and and, and some some and it's very easy to get sort of get in the mindset of let's plan for infinite scale on day one, but I but but more and more the advice is really to to avoid over engineering your problem, especially because you don't you don't even know where this where you're going to need the scalability. Uh, for us, it was always the weather data. Uh, I, 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 I joke that the, the history of Agrivol is told by how we dealt with, ag with weather data. And uh, from our very earliest time as a company, we were processing weather data for uh, staff scientists at ag companies to use. And then we started building out our weather APIs, and then we built out our platform that visualizes that weather data. And, uh, and then we, we expanded internationally, and, and we're moving into this, this global way of thinking. And I'm really, I'm excited about our continual innovation of how we deal with weather data. But, uh, but that, it turned out that that was really our, our biggest bottleneck of scale. And so we didn't, nece we didn't necessarily know that that was how it would go building out the web, app, the web platform. But uh, if, we had, if we had spent a ton of time scaling other parts that really ended up not being our issue, then it would, that, that would not have been time for us. It's also really important to, 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 have, to practice loose coupling between your different components. Uh, this is something that, I mean, it sounds obvious and, and it's very easy to say, and then it's also very easy to neglect that in the moments and then end up building things that are very tightly coupled. And even discussing what loose coupling means for different components is a, is a pretty major task and, uh, and, and often not intuitive. So, so really emphasizing that is, is I would say one of the secrets to being able to unlock scalability, uh, again, when you need it, where you need it. So I want to talk about DevOps, and, uh, and really, to me, the core of DevOps is that the development of a system and, and the maintenance and operation of the system are, are go hand in hand. And, uh, and really, I think, especially at the beginning of a project with a small team, everyone is DevOps. And, uh, and, and putting everyone in that mindset uh, means that, there's, that, that you don't have a culture of, of sort of lobbing the grenade over the fence and making it somebody else's problem, <coughs> that instead the team owns the challenges that they face and, and, and will, will spend the time and, and effort needed to discuss those problems and solve them. So, uh, yeah, having a support plan for, for a, a product once you release it is hugely important. I think that it's very easy to get caught off guard when, when you're just building something internally, when you're just using it internally, that uh, customers want to use it on evenings and weekends. And that's not very convenient for, uh, for the standard workday. So understanding how, how you're going to handle that is, is critical and there could be whole conversations on that and, and I'm probably not the best person to do that. Uh, and then, and then the last thing here, I would just say, document the how the system runs and what how you solve uh, sort of the typical system issues. And there always will be typical system issues, uh, but the more you can spread that knowledge among the team, the less likely it is that you need one specific person to always be available at when when something goes wrong. And so, distributing that knowledge is is very effective in uh, in. in addressing those issues in a timely fashion. And then this all kind of kind of culminates in the notion that the more complex the infrastructure is, the more effort you need to maintain it. Again, that's very obvious, but I think it but it's one of those things that kind of gets lost in the shuffle as you're building out new feature for customer A, new system for customer B, and uh, and then you don't realize that you're actually really kind of multiplying the burden on your, your support teams, on even the development teams themselves because uh, they're, they're the last line of defense when something goes wrong. It's always, if it can be solved as a customer support issue, great. If, it ha if it's a DevOps issue, then that's another layer. But then if, if it can't be fixed there, it needs to be fixed in the code. And so it's a software, it's a software development team issue. And so the more, the more systems you have out there, the more problems, the more, the more bugs or mis we'll call them misunderstood features there are <laughs> that, uh, that need to be that need to be changed or, or remedied in some way.
So security, uh, security should always be part of the conversation when building out new features. Uh, just, uh, I think the, the, the greatest enemy of security is negligence. And so a team just building something out without thinking about how that system can be misused or abused or access gained that is unauthorized, uh, I think just, just having those conversations prevents uh, a large, uh, large amount of failure states that, that could otherwise uh, occur. And so uh, access control, I think, is one of, the, one of the main things to focus on, both in terms of how you control access to your cloud environment for employees and internal stakeholders, but as well as, as access control in the website uh, or, or whatever the, the application is. Uh, like I said, as, uh, as Agrable, we built out a, very, a, a rather robust uh, access control permission system for sharing of data between accounts. And uh, that was very, uh, it was very hard. <laughs> and, uh, and we spent a long time discussing it, not only how the feature is supposed to work in the happy case, but how, it could, how, how to prevent people from, from shifting, from, from escalating credentials, from from misusing the system and, and making sure that, that we had those those discussions uh, were was, was really important and uh, but your most vulnerable aspects will always be the human effort, the human element uh, somebody sending an email to get someone to put their credentials into a fake web form there's it's very difficult to guard against that and from an internal perspective it's really about education and training uh, it's almost, uh, from an external perspective, really, MFA is kind of your only hope there. And uh, again, this is a very huge topic, but, but I'm just trying to kind of go a broad strategic overview. Uh, never putting credentials into your code, that's something that everybody says, and, but, but I think that understanding that, that different cloud platforms actually have built-in key stores for those credentials means that there's a best practices right way to do it. So embrace that, embrace that early and, and, and exclusively. And, and of course, as your project matures, uh, bringing in consultants to do external pen penetration testing uh, can actually reveal a host of issues. And uh, often the times that if, you're, if you are being attentive with security and you are thinking about your application security, uh, there always is going to be something you're not thinking about, and that's where that's where an external third party comes in. Uh, they and and they also don't won't be playing by the rules. So just because you're locking your, your front door doesn't mean they're not going to climb, crawl in through a window. And so uh, thinking about security as as building a perimeter, uh, you you want someone digging a tunnel beneath, and you want somebody thinking about the the uh, oblique ways to get in. Uh, so that you can you can lock those down as well. <coughs> so also kind of in a general sense, reviewing examples of, of successful architectures that solve similar problems. Uh, I learned about the AWS Architecture Center, and since then it's really big, become one of my first stops for uh, for almost anything that we that we attempt to do. Uh, we we heavily leverage AWS, so this is. This is AWS focused, but I'm sure there are other other similar resources, and and uh, I know Netflix has an amazing development blog where they are really quite transparent about how they manage their enormous scale. Uh, but but I pulled a few examples from that site to, to kind of go over, them. and like this is really your kind of very standard web app hosting uh, architecture. And, uh, and really, I mean, you can, and, and both, but when you look at these things, you really want to think about, okay, what, what matches our use case? What doesn't match our use case? It's also helpful to think through, are, the, is the, are these materials up to date with the latest practices? Like, for instance, this is, this is talking about RDS databases, whereas there are a lot more options now, so like Aurora and things like that, so you want to... You want to evaluate if there are places to, to innovate on, but generally this, this really lays out a lot of the concerns with respect to just the general host general domain resolution and, and hosting of static content. The just the idea that you separate your static content from your web application stack, 
uh, load balancing at the different layers that are that are relevant, database replication. So there are all kinds of, of these uh, of these diagrams that really help kind of set up what what your major concern should be, and then uh, and and you can kind of look at different examples. So this one is about batch processing, and it's kind of near and dear to my heart because that was one of the, one of the first things we built was our compute pipe was our data pipeline for our uh, batch processing of the morning farm report data. So we didn't have that we didn't have the benefit of this diagram when we built our we built our pipeline. Otherwise, we very possibly would have leveraged SQS a little more, but. Uh, but it's interesting kind of looking at this in the similarities and differences in how we did things. Um, another example is we built our own Kubernetes cluster and nowadays Amazon has a managed Kubernetes system which is very exciting and we're planning to take, take heavy advantage of that but it, it takes a lot of the work out of building a, a massive containerized compute cluster. <clears throat> So there's also the AWS well-architected framework, which, uh, which is more or less a set of, of guiding principles. And the principles are over here, operational excellence, security, reliability, performance efficiency, and cost optimization. Uh, they've got a really good white paper that, that really that, that explains the framework and goes through uh, sort of the, the, the key questions that you want to ask yourself and you want the team to discuss as they're building out an application. Uh, they also conduct well-architected reviews with their customers that where solution architects will discuss how you're solving, how you're approaching these problems and, and see kind of where you should, re, you should re, rededicate your efforts to, to improve on these different areas. But, uh, and, and in general, I would say your, your cloud provider is really your friend in these efforts and uh, reaching out to solution architects and, uh, and taking advantage of, of their time, which is to help you be successful so that you are you stay and grow as a customer of theirs. So really it's a it's a it's a win-win situation. So really to kind of sum this up, I, I, I want to impress upon people that uh, the goal is to manage your, your infrastructure as a strategic resource, that uh, it is a defining element of your, your, your startup or your, your business enterprise and just doing engineering in a vacuum will, uh, will, will lead to, to issues and, and mistakes and they'll, they'll be costly and potentially uh, existential to, to the business. And so really just kind of having that broad perspective and then having those conversations I think can, can uh, prevent a lot of issues up front. So. So those are my slides. I figured we could we could do some questions. There's also some really interesting stuff on that architect, well architected on that AWS Architecture Center site. So we could do a little tour of that as well. But yes. So I wanted to ask about you made a lot of comments about teams that I thought were really great. So I'm curious at at Agile and Nutrien, in, in, in the case of the work that you guys are doing, how, are you talking about? Few big teams, a lot of small teams. What would you see? Yeah, no, that's a great question about what the size of a team should be, and, and so uh, it's interesting because yeah, at, at Agrable we we went through several different paradigms of teaming, and uh, as sort of that in our sort of startup and growth phase, we were we were pretty much all aligned on uh, on functional team lines where we had sort of a team focused of of all front end developers doing our front end development. Uh, back-end developers doing our back-end develop back-end web API uh, and data model development, and then uh, infrastructure teams building out our data pipeline, and then uh, and kind of aligned on those on those boundaries uh, as part of Nutrien, and and now as as we've scaled up as a larger group, we've realized that that approach doesn't really scale to the level of complexity that we need. So we're more following what's called the Spotify model, where uh, where development squad, where, where cross-functional squads are arranged centered around features. And so there, there's a product owner that, that owns a certain feature or a certain, certain aspect of the, of the, the application. And then the, the, they will determine, they with the, with the tech leads will determine what squad resources are needed. Do they need to be more front-end heavy? Do they need to be more back-end? Do they need to be 
Uh, do they need to deal with streaming data, with, with Kinesis or something like that? And so they'll, they'll, they'll bring together the, the experts they need to then work in an agile fashion, uh, more or less until that, the, the goal they set out to achieve is complete, and then the squads will reorient themselves around new objectives. And so we, we've been sort of transitioning into that model, which has certain advantages. I think one of the big challenges I've found with the squad model is coordination between squads to ensure that you don't solve the same problem five different ways. Uh, that's, that's definitely something that can happen. Uh, so I think having uh, a sort of guild of architects that, are, that, that cut through all of the different sort of groups of squads uh, can allow those conversations to, to bubble up and say, let's have one way of solving this problem, not five, five different ways, and sort of have a little bit more of that, that uh, centralization of concerns so that you can, you can have the, the rigorous debate needed to, to achieve a good solution. Does, yes. does that, um, sorry, um, guild of, of, of architects belong um, across the organization or within the same team? Yeah, across the organization. Yeah. So the idea would be, yeah, so if, if we've got a, a group of squads that are all building out e-commerce features, there might be an architect among them. If they're and then a group doing doing data engineering, there would be an architect among them. And when 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 things cross over, when we say, okay, how do we how do we surface data so that we can put a search box on our e-commerce website that works and is constantly updated by our, our our legacy systems, then that becomes an architecture conversation. It could it potentially also is a larger conversation between those squads as a whole to say, all right, all of you are affected by these decisions. Let's discuss it and really about really pushing those decisions down to the level where people are, are most impacted by them and then bringing, them, bringing those conclusions back up so that they can be shared among the, among the organization is really the, <coughs> the kind of pattern that, that I'm, I'm, I'm reinforcing. So I think the algorithm story is a great story. I wondered if you could sort of kind of think back in time and say, what would it have been like to do uh, what you've done before the public cloud? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it's interesting because even before the public cloud, there were a lot of those uh, sort of rack space style models mm -hmm. of the, the kind of co-located server, servers. Mm -hmm. So I imagine that that's more or less the model we would have taken. Uh, as a startup, as a as a as a cloud-enabled startup, we were we ended up having one system that was our on-prem server, and uh, I did a lot of the early work for our early contracts, but was quickly sort of mostly deprecated, I'll say, in favor of the cloud resources. But I, I feel like we would have taken if we are only jumping far enough back in time, where we still have access to that kind of technology. I imagine we would leverage that very happily uh, because otherwise, you're building your own. Rackspace type company within your organization as a core capability and we had enough people with the experience of having done that in different ways that they knew we didn't want to do that. <laughs> so, and actually that's a, that is a, a common way I, I end up thinking about things is I think about are we building a different company inside of our company to solve a specific problem and if we're doing that that's probably a, a caution we should probably take that under caution and, and and think about if there's a solution out there that we can leverage instead. So I see some uh, students uh, in the room, and I have an uh, instructional role. Uh, I'm trying to understand how to prepare data science students for a cloud-first world. And I wonder what guidance you would have for students and educators in order to uh, have the folks go into the marketplace prepared to be a part of uh, teams like yours? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. I think the, my, my first instinct is to say, get your hands dirty. And so, so practice, like a lot of the cloud providers have, have free tiers of service or, uh, or credits that they give to, in certain situations. So, 
So getting experience with those systems, do experimenting, doing following tutorials, doing toy problems, uh, those are all great ways to get experience with this stuff. Uh, working with, obviously, in an in internship capacity with, with companies that are, that are in the cloud is very important, especially when those companies have you working on production teams doing production level projects. I think that that's, that's one of the best. I, we, we, we always try to provide that experience at Agrable for our, for our internships, and uh, I think that's, that's best for both sides of the, of the equation. So I, I always push for very practical internships. Uh, and then, I guess I'd also say cultivating that, that sort of passion for learning and that excitement around uh, embracing what's next, uh, embracing new technology, moving from standard web applications to microservices to serverless. And it's not always right to jump to, jump to the latest and greatest thing, but being open-minded to it so that you can understand it well enough to critique and, and debate it is I think a, a under uh, I think under underrepresented as a as a skill set because I think people it's very common for people to to get into one mode of thinking about how to solve a problem and solve that problem and just continue on as that as I've seen companies do that I've seen individuals do that and I think that it it, it becomes a limiting factor throughout the lifespan of a career. What is next? What is next? Well, I think serverless is, is a big thing, is a big part that's next. Uh, AI and ML obviously uh, is making huge strides and becoming more and more is going to be more and more automatic as a part of every system. Uh, I think that sort of that will become a new layer in kind of either a web application, tech stack, a data pipeline. Uh, it's going to be. Yeah. I mean, automatic is the best word I can think of to describe it because it will, it'll just be, these are the AI recommendations alongside whatever it is you're doing. And so, both in the, in the code editor, both in the sort of infrastructure and cloud interfaces, and then ultimately in front of all the users and consumers of, of these products. Yes. Building on the theme of what's next and your thoughts, so there are are different declarative language for specifying infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, this morning I spent a lot of time with Ansible. Yeah, yeah. And so that's on my mind, but you're, but yeah, you know, so I'll try and make it within parameters. So what is your thoughts on, say, a declarative language Ansible compared with AWS CloudFormation? Yeah. And, you know, are you, has your guild architect looked at this? And, and are your squads implementing things? That's a great question. Uh, so, so we've definitely in, embraced an infrastructure as code mindset. Uh, I think that we, I think that that's always an evolving journey, and we we've, we've noticed some strengths and some weaknesses with that approach. Uh, definitely, the the sort of immutability of the infrastructure and the ability the, the ability to instantly recover from a from a bad situation uh, is is the core strength of that approach. Uh, but I think there's a lot to be uh, discovered about the flexibility and the ability to prototype with uh, with embracing infrastructure as code. Uh, it seems to me that there's a there there are correct stages of productionization where it, where you, you would say, all right, now it's time to to freeze this as infrastructure as code so that we can we can reap all those benefits. But if we're experimenting, if we're just building out a prototype, then maybe very rigid infrastructure as code is not the right answer. Um, I also think that a lot of those tools, it's interesting because there's there's about a dozen tools or more in that space you could you could put it bring into conversation and they all have very different philosophies and things that they care about and then are very agnostic to. And so I think matching that with your your team's development philosophy is very important. And so that that's the way that's the way we approach that. We're still going on a journey with that as well, so so I don't think there's a very very strongly established best practices there yet. Thank you. Just to comment on that a little further, I work for a, a, a cloud consulting company out of Chicago. Uh, so we work with a lot of Fortune 500s, and what we see the most of right now for in that space is Terraform. Yeah. There's a lot, a lot of traditional as they're moving out of the data center. Using Terraform because it's easier to use in cloud. 
Have you seen situations with prototyping in a, in a Terraform type environment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because they can, a lot of what you said, we see them a lot of build it by hand, yeah. see what works, and yeah. then kind of back build it into Terraform. Yeah. And, uh, there's ways you can like pull stuff out of your cloud into Terraform, like an import. It, it's kind of an auto detect kind of thing. Yeah, but it's static that comes a lot of stuff. It takes like a snapshot exactly how it is. Right. So there's still some work to do after that, but right. it can get you close. Interesting. Yeah. I always have more questions. <laughs> um, All right. So, uh, as I mentioned, I think the admirable story is one of the great stories of back tech. So not just from the perspective of cloud computing, was there sort of a surprising source of joy or satisfaction in your journey? Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess from my perspective, it's interesting. I uh, Agrable was really my entry into into, into agriculture, and so, uh, but but I've realized throughout my career that I, I really personally enjoy bringing uh, sort of the the latest and greatest sort of technology to to people that, that hadn't yet haven't yet experienced it. So for me, what what I really enjoyed about Agrable was our ability to say, all right. Now we're going to put we're going to put in your hands a uh, a, a web application that will show will show you what your yields are going to be this year before you even plant it. Uh, we're going to put into your hands an ability to track every farm operation you do on the field and uh, and then get get paid more for because you're uh, because you're you're certified as growing sustainably and then so that 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 food company that's buying your grain can put certified sustainable on their packaging uh, and, and that's to me that's about leveraging the data in a new way that 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 neither that neither party was capable of doing without without a system that integrated that and so that bringing together of those different stakeholders to, to achieve something new is something I get I get really excited about and I, I just love the phrase network of agriculture because to me that really summed up what we were what we were, were striving to achieve as agrable um, Another example is the drone application. Uh, the ability for an insur a crop insurance company to have uh, independent in uh, insurance adjuster or independent contractors piloting drones that then would send data to the adjuster that now doesn't even necessarily have to visit the field. Uh, and then they can see the data, they can mark what the damage is, they can review it with the grower and confirm that we're all on the same page with what the insurance claim is gonna be. Uh, is the ability for technology to facilitate that, that kind of workflow and match it alongside with things like our yield model estimates, the field story tracking, the sustainability, and, and to be able to bring that all together on a unified platform rather than as a series of point solutions done either by separate companies or, I, I mean, a lot of companies take that point solution approach with their, with their product portfolios. Uh, but our ability to, to bind all that together was really my sort of core joy out of building building Agrable. Sometimes when I speak, I end up thinking, I wish someone would ask me about X. And uh, I wonder if you might be harboring sort of a, I wish someone in this group would ask me about X. Or I hope they don't ask about X. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, no, I actually, I, I, I really liked your question about, about what, what did I find joy in, because I, I think that that, I, I actually think that's a, that's a very important thing to be thinking about. And, and for me, maintain, building and maintaining the enthusiasm of teams is something that, that, that I found to be hugely important. And because sometimes, sometimes it's, it's solving a number of small problems with the with how the team is working can can really set them up for success and kind of give them that 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 sort of tailwind that that pushes them forward and so really that that maintaining that culture and growing that culture of, of innovation of creativity uh, that that's the kind of thing that I think is is some of the secret sauce behind all of this and that fits in with your observation from very early in your remarks about. The team is the most important part of any infrastructure company. Yeah, exactly. I would definitely agree with that. I mean, with all the companies that I work with, most engagements that I see that fail is because of the team. It's 
almost never because of the, the technology that you get a team that's just not behind it or just not enthusiastic to go and push it, work on it, and be the champion. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter how good it is. Yeah. Do we have any story about scale and cost optimization? So we didn't expect that the scale would go up like this. Yeah. And it's cost suddenly blew up. And is there a way that you put it down through the yeah. out from the AWS? Yeah. Yeah. That that's a great question. And yeah, I mean, there could be a whole a whole set a whole a whole talk on on just sort of cost optimization and, and managing that. Uh, I think our biggest insight early on was that our only at a certain point did our cloud resources start to be anywhere near as worthy of consideration compared to our engineering costs and our development time. And so really optimizing for development time early is, is the right answer. Uh, but then as, you, as, you, as costs increase, uh, I would say the, big, the, the most important thing is, is to, to cultivate an awareness of it and to uh, because there, are, there, are, there will be things that happen that, that are pure inefficiencies that just need to be refactored or reoriented or, oh, we didn't know that was so much money, we need to, we need to set expiration times on S3 bucket items. That's, that's a very common thing that, that is a, it's sort of a phantom, and, and a phantom cost driver. And, uh, but, but making sure you've got that balance between uh, building out new features, improving efficiency for time, improving efficiency for cost. Uh, I think the other aspect of that is, and, and part of why people kind of say, worry about scalability when you hit that point, is that if your business model is right, you will have the resources to contend with the scalability problems when you reach them. And if, if you haven't figured out that business model yet, then that scaling then the, then, then the fact that your platform activity is scaled has not resulted in revenue, in the kind of revenue you need. And that's when you're in a very difficult situation where, where you don't have the funds to tackle the cost optimization problem, but now you have the expenses without, without the benefit. And so I would say, to me, the, the biggest uh, antidote to that is, is awareness of the problem, awareness of the, the changes in cost, and then, and, 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 Keeping, hold, keeping the team aware and, and accountable for, uh, for being responsible with their costs and not just provisioning resources and forgetting about them or, or scaling without a discussion about it. Other questions? I feel like we just had a great load of wisdom this is, this is well, really great. I certainly appreciate your, your willingness to, to come and help with this, and congratulations on the, the great success of the firm. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's, it, I'm very excited about this stuff, so I'm, I'm happy for any opportunity to discuss it with people that are interested. So thank you, everybody, for your time. And, and definitely, I do recommend you check out the AWS Architecture Center. There's a lot of resources, a lot of videos of companies sharing their architecture stories and how they deal with, with these challenges. So the resources are out there to, to get answers on these things. Thanks, everybody.